Oh, it's fine. It's fine. Okay, let's go to uh, Exodus again. This time Exodus chapter 28. Uh, <clears throat> Actually, I may just give you some, some basic scriptures. I may just read them and you can write them down. I, I think I'm going to do that to give you some basic scriptures about the Day of Atonement. So the name of the last class was the feasts in general. The name of this class is uh, Day of Atonement, and uh, we're going to be dealing um, primarily with the garments of the high priest this time. Um, but before we do that, before we do that, I tell you what, let me just read you some scriptures. If you would like to turn there, Leviticus chapter 16, let's just do this. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do is give you a basic scriptural picture of the Day of Atonement, just out of the scriptures, by reading. And I want to do it first in the Old Testament, and then I want to do it from the New Testament so that you can see that this is this day, the day, how incredibly important it is and how it plays big in the New Testament also. Leviticus 16. And the Lord spoke unto Moses after the death of his two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat. All right, so Moses is talking to Aaron. Who is Aaron? His brother. What else? High priest. Very good. It's the high priest. So he's telling, Moses is telling, he got the information from God, telling Aaron, the high priest, look, there's this holy of holies place, and you do not just go in there any old time you want to. There's only one time a year you're going to go in there. And that's during the Day of Atonement. Okay? So can anybody see how important the Day of Atonement would be in light of all the other feasts? It's the one time of the year that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. All right. Uh, Aaron, thy brother, that he shall come not at all times into the holy place within the veil uh, before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat, um, thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. All right, so start taking note. We'll dissect this and we'll divide it up. But start taking note of what it is he had to bring in to the tabernacle, what he had to offer on the Day of Atonement, the biggest day of the year. Um, <clears throat> Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen mitre shall he be attired. These are the holy garments, therefore shall he wash his flesh in water, and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, and one ram for a burnt offering. All right, can anybody tell me just by what we've read what kind of offerings he's taking in to the Holy of Holies? All right, he's taking a, a sin offering called a bullock, which is a, a small bull, and a ram for a burnt offering. Now we just read he's taking a kid of the goats and a ram for the burnt offering, okay? Verse 4 again, uh, let's see, verse uh, 5. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering, one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the, of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. Now this is significant even in Christ, and we'll get into all that. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. All right? 
So we see in verse 7 that he takes these two goats at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. They didn't have dice back then. So they cast lots. One lot for the Lord and the other one for the scapegoat. We'll find out the difference. Two goats, two, two kids, which is a baby goat. And then there was a random selection of which one would be the sin offering that would die and which one would be the scapegoat. Anybody ever heard that term scapegoat before? You don't even want to be this scapegoat. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. Let's see, I read that. Verse 9. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer it for a sin offering. But, B-U-T, but the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with it and to let it go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. What powerful words. And Aaron shall bring the bullock, we're back to the baby bull, and Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off of the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. Now a censer is like a little hanging thing, little hanging bowl, that he would put incense in it and light it and have to carry that and fill that holy of holies with that incense as he comes in. And he, let's see, read 12 again. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord and his hands full of sweet incense, beaten small, and bring it within the veil. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock, the, the, little, the, the first thing that he offered, and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood within the veil. So he just brought in the, the bullock blood. Now he goes out and kills the goat of the sin offering, the goat, and he brings its blood in and bring it within the veil, and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock. He's repeating it, but he's doing one with the bullock, and now he's doing the second time he's going, and consider this, the second time he's going within the veil. Two times. Never did find that third one. Two times. He goes in the Holy of Holies. How many of you knew that the high priest went in twice? Twice. Not just once. He's got to go in there twice. He's got to go in once, come back out, and go in again. All right. Um, And verse 16, and he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions in all their sins. And shall, so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and his household and all the congregation of Israel. I mean, it didn't just say you can't be in the Holy of Holies. It said you can't be in the tabernacle of the con congregation while this is going on. Only one person is in that tabernacle while this is taking place. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it 
from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. All right. Now this next part is going to talk about the scapegoat. Remember, there were two goats brought, and lots were cast, and the lot that fell on one goat became what's called the Lord's goat. That, lo that goat was killed as a sin offering. The other goat, we're going to read about what happens to the scapegoat. All right, verse 20. And when he hath finished atoning for the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation, the altar, he shall bring the live goat. This is after he's atoned. He shall bring the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of... This is all of the iniquities of the children of Israel. This is everything they ever did in the whole year. This could take a while. Well, anyway, you understand that this is, this is the impartation. I mean, imagine all your sins in the past year. Okay, now imagine all yours and mine. Now imagine everybody's put on this goat. All right. And Aaron shall lay both, verse 22, 21, And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all of their transgressions uh, and all of their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send it away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. Okay, the wilderness would be like the wilderness that Israel passed through, a land with no water and with wild beasts. And, the, and remember, these are not goats, these are kids. A kid is the proper name for a, a, a small baby goat. Okay? And the goat shall bear upon it all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. And he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. And Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of the congregation and shall put off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. Now, notice make an atonement. The atonement has already been made for sin. And I, in my studies, I have run across this word atonement many times in relationship to not sin offerings, but sweet savor offerings, which have nothing to do with sin. Because in my opinion, and this is strictly my opinion, from all that I've studied about the way this word atonement is used, it's not just atoning for sins, it is the atonement of, another way you can say it, I can't write it, but I can say it, is the word atonement is, if you broke it up, it would be at one meant. That's atonement, at one. Atone, at one meant. I personally believe that the atonement is more than just taking care of sins. That God's intention for the sacrifices and all that he did was not just to get Israel out of sin, but to bring them into oneness with himself. And the atonement is not fulfilled until this is brought about. Now, let me just give you a few things to ponder. I'm saying this because why, if it just dealt with sins, why wouldn't the Day of Atonement be the very first offer, very first feast uh, in the beginning of the year? Why would you wait all the way down to the end of the year and have a Day of Atonement? Why not start out being clean and all of your sins gone for the last year and whatever? But he waits all the way to the seventh month but in the first month, there's Passover. And why, I mean, consider, what's the difference between Passover and the Day of Atonement? I'll tell you right off, in most Christians' mind, nothing. There is no difference between the two. It's basically the same thing. 
But I'm telling you, I'm telling, and, and I'll even throw another one at you since we're trying to stir you up a little bit. Passover happened for people that were already the children of God. It was the children of Israel. It was, they were the children of God. They didn't, they didn't get saved on the day of Passover and become God's people. The Passover came to God's people. So just, I mean, consider that. Israel was already chosen way back with Abraham and your seed, and that was his seed that was already there. So we make Passover and we make the crossing of the Red Sea and we make the killing of the lamb and the putting the blood on the doorpost the beginning in the sense of salvation. But I'm saying that these feasts represent a harvest and a movement beyond just saving people from something, but bringing people into something. Therefore, if, if, if my conjectures are correct, then atonement has way more to do than just with atoning for your sins. And that's why we just read this scripture that says that you will take the burn offerings and offer them for an atonement after the sin offering's already been accepted, folks. And after it says, you know, that, the, that, that, work, that part of the work of atonement has taken place. All right, so I've given you just some things to think about. Um, okay, in verse... Uh, well, let's go back to 24. And he shall wash his flesh with water in the holy place and put on his garments and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make an atonement for himself and for the people. And now, let me say again. Let me just make sure. There is no burnt offering that makes an atonement for sin. It's not possible. They're not even in the same category. So this is, a, this is bringing an at-one-ment or a complete picture of what atonement means. All right. And the fat of the sin offering shall he burn upon the altar. And that's, that's significant. Not just the word fat, but that shall be burned on the altar. And he who let go the goat for the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water and afterwards come into the camp. But the bullock for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, all right, we just, we just jumped three things in just three, about three verses. We just offered the bullocks, uh, the, the uh, rams for the atonement of the people and the atonement of the, the priest. Then in the next verse, um, we, the man who let go the scapegoat has returned to the camp. And now, in verse 27, and the bullock for sin offering, goat offering for the sin offering, um, for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall carry forth outside of the camp, and they shall burn it, in the fire, their skins and their flesh, and their dung. You may not see it yet, and we'll get into it. But some very different things just took place. Nothing random here. Remember in our, in our presentation of what this class would be like, at orientation, we talked about Moses' face glowing after God had told him about the feasts. That's the primary thing that was spoken on that second time that he went up before God. And his face didn't glow after the first time. But his face did glow after the second time. We mentioned some of those things. Right here, this starts dividing some things out. And again, you may not understand it all right now. That's the purpose of having a class. Can anybody say amen? 
You, you, you know, but there are some wonderful things just happen right there, just incredible things that will make you glow if you really understand what, what's going on on our behalf and in the, in the reality. So much more than gab, gab, let's talk about the Day of Atonement. Oh, my God, no, reality jumping, I mean, r truth and light and life jumping out of the pages instead of, uh, well, he needs to take a gold, kill it, and he needs to take this and kill that, and then he takes something else and kill I mean, you know, it can be boring to read this mess, but I'm telling you, there's life in every word, but we've got to find the life. We've got to ask the Holy Spirit to open the Word of God, and then we've got to ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts to receive the truth of what He opens out of the Word of God. All right, and then verse uh, 28, And he who burneth them shall wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in water, and afterwards he shall come into the camp. And this shall be a statute forever unto you that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls. All right. What we read up to this point about the Day of Atonement has had to do with the physical work of the priest primarily. Now it's talking about what you're doing while he's doing. Okay. Your part. Um... You shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. And on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. And the priest whom you shall anoint and whom he, sh ye, he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead, shall make the atonement and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments, and he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. Now doesn't that sound a little strange? He's going to make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. Do you know what the sanctuary is? The san I mean, you know, we... Well, we say, we would, we'd say, let's come into church, yeah. Yeah, and, and we'll, well, no, no, it is. It's perfectly according to what we're going to show. Right, right. But we'll, we'll get into that, and we'll show how it's exactly doing what we're talking about here. Um, and, we'll, and we will get into it, and we will talk about it. So, um, so he shall make an atonement f uh, for the... For the holy sanctuary. The sanctuary is the holy of holies. He, you're going to make atonement for the place that no man has been in there for a whole year? You're going to make an atonement for a place that only God dwells in? If you use the word atonement as we understand it. You're going to... You're going to clean up something that man has not touched, breathed on, been involved with, and was not even allowed? You're going to atone for the holy sanctuary, which is the holy of holies. That's, anytime you see the word sanctuary in the Bible, it's not talking about the whole tabernacle. It's only talking about the holy of holies. Okay? All right. And he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation, for the altar, and he shall make an atonement for the priest, for all the people of the congregation. And this shall be an everlasting statute unto you to make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once in a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. All right. Let's uh, flip over to, uh, and, and again, uh, Le uh, Leviticus 23. <clears throat> I don't apologize for these first two classes on just going over the scriptures. <laughs> There's no way we can discuss this if you don't have at least some sort of an idea 
of what the Bible is talking about on the Day of Atonement. Because there's not just some magical Day of Atonement. We say, oh, there was a Day of Atonement. That's the day Jesus died on the cross and it's over with and we're atoned for. Well, yes, but that would be like that would be like somebody sitting in their home, not coming up to the feast on the Day of Atonement, and saying, okay, the priest up there doing something for us, and we don't know what it is, but thank God. I'm sorry. God insisted you come up or you die. He didn't just kick you out. Well, if you're not committed, I'm going to kick you out. You know, no. You're, de you're dead. You're dead. You're, you're believing things, but you're dead. You're not moving by life. You don't have the spirit of it. You don't have God's reality of it. All you've got is just some, a few facts that you rest in some facts instead of resting in the Lord, instead of finding your hope in the Lord, instead of believing the Lord, not just believing what the Lord said, believing the Lord. And believing the truth. What is the truth? The truth has to do with all of these, these divine elements. All right. So there will be some repeating here, but in Leviticus 23, verse 26, this is pretty short. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And ye shall do no servile work in that same day, for it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatsoever soul it is that shall not be afflicted in that same day, he shall be cut off from among his people. And whatsoever soul it is that, do, that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among the people. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict your soul in the ninth day of the, the month at evening. From, even, from evening unto evening shall you celebrate your Sabbath. All right. Now let's consider the truth of what we just read. The other scriptures we read gave you the workings of how it goes about. These scriptures are talking about you and your tenor during the Day of Atonement. All right. Let's compare what we just read, which is a shadow of the true, compared to what we think doctrinally without any thought of these things. Okay. All right. Here's what we think doctrinally. Day of Rest. Enter into rest. When you enter into rest, you have peace. When you enter into rest, you're happy. Am I right or wrong? Think about it. Everybody wants to enter into rest because they believe something. And what they believe is that when I'm at rest, there is no, my soul is not a problem. Can I get an amen from somebody? But this is saying, you shall afflict your soul during this Sabbath, this Day of Atonement. That there is actually something else going on, and the rest that we enter into is actually not our rest, but His rest. He's the one that's at rest. It doesn't tell you to enter into rest. Folks, it tells you to enter into His rest. Why? Because God's not trying to bring you into rest. He's trying to bring you into the understanding of his rest. But I tell you what, if you're going to enter that rest, it's going to afflict your soul. You're not going to be all happy and at peace and everything. You're going to have problems in the area of the soul. But this is saying you can actually enter into that, the rest of the Day of Atonement have an afflicted soul and still be of God. Is that, yeah, is that, does that work for anybody? All right, let's take another myth. We believe that if we're, if, if, you know, if we have entered into that rest, that everything is now settled. Well, guess what? You're right. Everything in him but everything in you is not settled. 
But are you not in his rest? In the truest reality of what Christ did, not based on your soul or the circumstances, are you, have you entered into his rest? And the truth is, yes, he died and brought you in by oneness. So God wants you to know of his rest, that he's at rest and you're one with him. His, enter into his rest. I'm not going to flip over there and take you through all those scriptures in uh, Hebrews, but that's what it's saying. It's telling you to enter into his rest. There is a rest for the people of God, but it's us entering into his rest, us finding that he has sat down, that he's at rest, and that he says, and you're one with me, you're my member, so you've sat down, but only in me. You haven't sat down in you. You, you know, as long as you're trying to make this your rest, you're going to be real upset with an afflicted soul because you're going to not understand that. But all of Israel had afflicted souls and at the same moment were resting. You tell me if it's not right there. We just read it. The, we're supposed to draw the true from the shadows, not from some fairy tale teaching that we've had. How do we know we're on track unless it's, we can see it from shadow to substance? How do we know? We don't. We, just because somebody tells you when you're at rest, you're going to be peaceful and everything's going to be wonderful and nothing ever will bother you again, you will be settled. Do you know anybody like that? <laughs> and if you're thinking, well, Randy, you seem to be that way, you don't know me. I'm telling you, especially me this year. You have no clue of the roller coaster wild ride I've been on. I mean, it's been, it's been, you know, I just, I don't even want to talk about it. I don't. I don't want to talk about it. <clears throat> but I will tell you one thing. We wrestle on the inside, don't we? Let us not wrestle with the darkness. Let us wrestle to lay hold of the truth even in affliction. Let us not wrestle to change the affliction so, and then call it rest. That's a lie. Don't wrestle to change the afflicted soul. Wrestle to keep yourself before the Lord in rest while your soul is afflicted. Why? How? Because during that time you have been brought into oneness. And why would God... Why would God on the day, oh, this is the day, why would God on the day make you be afflicted for several days in a row after that? Why would he do that? I'll tell you exactly why. He doesn't want you going by your soul. He doesn't want you going by happy feelings. He doesn't want you having to depend on everything going right, he wants you to rest in the middle of the affliction. Well, how do you rest in the affliction? You rest by quit, by, by ceasing from trying to bring your soul to rest. Because to do that would violate the Sabbath. You're striving, you're working. The rest means it's settled. Well, how do I see it settled? It doesn't seem settled in me. It's not settled in you. It's settled in him. Be one. Have faith. Have faith in oneness. And then if you have faith in oneness, what do you have faith in? Rest. Because he sat down. And you were in him when he sat down. Does not, doesn't it say that in Ephesians? He were, we, were, we were raised up and made to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Folks, the... the proper way of viewing that isn't that he raised up a whole bunch of people 
and we all sit in a big throne. There's about 15 billion of us sitting in this big throne. He raised us up and made us sit together. Well, that's uncomfortable. No. We were raised up together as his body, as one with him, as bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And he's at rest over this. He is. He's probably at rest in his soul over it. But you're not because he doesn't want you. He commanded you to have an afflicted soul and believe in rest and be in rest. Don't do any survival. Don't get up. Don't try to fix it. Just believe that you have entered into the Day of Atonement, the day. You have entered into the day. Anybody ever studied that out in the Scriptures in the New Testament? The day? That Jesus is the day? It's an incredible study. The day. Why? Because we were darkness, and the light that is the day has dawned, and the day dawn and the day star, that's the sun, day star, the sun's a star, the day star arises in your heart. Who arises in your heart? The sun. The sun. That's so, yeah. The sun, the day star, arises in your heart. In other words, the revelation of the one that is at rest that you're in is now coming forth in you and whether your soul gets all fixed or not, anybody ever heard this song, I shall not be, I shall not be moved? Anybody ever heard that? Okay, but here's what we say. I can't sing. <laughs> I can't sing it because my soul, I'm moved all the time. I'm moved, I'm moved. I feel like I'm a, you know, a, a military brat, an army brat. I'm moving all the time. Uh, Guess what? What's not moved is Christ who sat down. What's not moved is the one who is at rest. And if you will believe that you're there, even if you're freaking out, but I'm in him, I'm one, and he has accepted me where? In the beloved. You're accepted in union with him. You are not accepted by him. If he looked at you on your own merits, you are rejected. You are rejected. You are an outcast. You're not his friend. You are an ugly, quivering mass of flesh capable of the worst crimes. So quit trying to make that acceptable. Reckon that dead. I was in Christ when he was crucified. That's how I died. I was in him. He joined with me in the Garden of Gethsemane. He drank the cup. And then took us to the cross. Because you wouldn't go to the cross apart from Christ. You wouldn't. I wouldn't. None of us do. We're, you know, the lamb is taken there, and I haven't told this story in a long, long time, but you probably heard it recently on one of your classes. But I, when I was a missionary in Jamaica, my wife and I were missionaries there. There was a lady um, who was the junior high teacher at the time I arrived there. And she told us this story that one time her and a bunch of college students, they went out to this retreat place oh, up in North Dakota or somewhere. They went to this retreat place, and they got there, and while they were there, and there was like 15 of them, and while they were there, a big blizzard came and just covered the place. Just covered the place. And they had whatever food they had with them, but they ended up staying because nobody could get to them. And in fact, the retreat center was one of the kids, some relative let them have it, so it wasn't like there were overseers or anything. It was just a bunch of kids that came out there. 
And while they're out there, this blizzard happens, and they're snowed in, and they can't get out, and they can't go anywhere. And so they had what little food they had, and that lasted, you know. I mean, once you know you don't have food, you get real hungry. You know, normally you'd eat only this much, you know, but once you realize this is all the food, we go, you eat more for some reason, you know, and that's our flesh. And they, in a few days, they'd gone through all their food, and they started freaking out. Well, in this thing, there was a pasture, and there were some sheep out there. And so they decided they're going to have to go kill one of those sheep. And she said they all went out there, they all climbed, they had to literally climb out through the top of the door to go out there. And the pen was over there and it was kind of on a hill and where the, they put it just where it's supposed to be. I don't know if you know how this is, but a lot of times if, depending on the fixation of mountains and stuff, they'll hit those things and then pass on and just leave a light sprinkling on certain areas of it. The sheep were there, they went up there and they got, they started with a lamb. And they got a lamb, and they brought it back, and somebody got, all they had in there was a rusty butcher knife. And they said, we're going to have to kill this lamb. And she told me this story. We're going to have to kill this lamb and eat it. And none of them had ever done anything like that before. So they get the lamb, and they got, the, the, it's a pretty big blade, she said, but she said it was rusty and not very sharp. And she said, one of the guys volunteered, you know, to hold it down and everything, and, and, and one of the guys decided to slit its throat. They got over there and just started slicing its throat. Nobody had to hold it down. It just laid there. It just laid there and was just slowly cutting through the skin and everything, just laying there until it died, until it got all the way through, the blood ran out, and then they ended up skinning it and cooking it up and saved their life. The lamb saved their life. And then later they got help and they got out of there. <clears throat> I've never forgotten that story because you read stuff, you know a certain amount of stuff. But this girl, if it was a lady, school teacher, I'm telling you, you'd have to know this person. She didn't make this up. This really happened. And... The, the thing that impacted her the most was she said, that lamb didn't struggle at all. He just laid there until we killed it. And he said, man, that made it worse, you know. Folks, you would not go to the cross. You're not a lamb. Jesus is a lamb. If you ever want to be a lamb, it's only going to be Jesus in you. You will never be lamb-like. Or you, you could be lamb-like, but it's a... It's a wolf in sheep's clothing. We have survival instincts that want to save us, that kick in. That's why. Does anybody understand why we preach Christ in you? <laughs> because there is no hope for us apart from Jesus and his life within us. Because we may be saved from sin, but we're going to run around like wolves, violating everyone and getting our own way. And even if we're not maliciously doing that, folks, I'm telling you, I ask the Lord to reveal certain things in me. And I'm, I'm you know, just a few things that he brought up. I'm shocked of things. You know, it's like, it's like this. We, we go deeper and deeper with the Lord. And so after 40 years... We think we're doing pretty good. But oh, the depths of what's still us and not Christ yet. It's just, it's just a shame because, you know, I've, I've often said this too. Uh, there's, there's an old saying, good, better, best. Never let it rest. Always make your good better and your better best. Because good is the enemy of better. And better is the enemy of the best. Because when we're doing good, See, when do you seek God? When you're doing bad. <laughs> That's when you really get after the Lord. But when you're doing good, you don't give it. You're not shooting for better. Or when you're doing better, you're not shooting for best. You're just glad to be out of the bad. See? 
there are, there, I mean, when you think of the ancient of days without beginning, without end, you think of your little life and what you've learned in here. It is mind-blowing to understand that the one who wants to live in us is, is the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first, the last, the length and the breadth and the height and the depth. And my good keeps him from getting more ground, you understand, from getting more ground in me. So, I, I don't want to be a religious person. I want to be someone that has Christ formed in me. I don't want to be, you know, the one that's always right. I don't want to be... I don't, I don't want to be respected for me and my accomplishments. Listen to what I just said. I would like, if I get any respect at all, that it just be because somebody saw Jesus. That really is my desire. Just, Father, allow somebody to see Jesus in me. That's, that's my prayer. All right, I don't want to keep lingering on this. I'm not really getting through these scriptures very fast here. Of course, that's not unusual, is it? Um, let's see. Let's go to Numbers 29. And I'm going to have to retitle <laughs> this because I said we were going to get into the garments and we hadn't got into the garments at all. We're just reading scriptures. Let's see. What would this one be titled? Oh, man. Um, yeah, let's just call it the day, or let's see. In parentheses, let's call it the day. Is that all right? <clears throat> We're trying to title all of our classes from now on. And uh, sometimes it gets hard when you think you're going to go one direction and then the Lord takes off and takes you because he wants to say something to our hearts. I'm still trying to find Numbers 29. All right, verse 7. And you shall, and you shall have on the tenth day of this seventh month an holy convocation, and you shall afflict your souls, and you shall not do any work therein, but you shall offer a burnt offering unto the Lord for a sweet savor, one young bullock, one ram, seven lambs of the first year shall be unto you without blemish. All right. I like the way this worded. I just like the way the Word of God just says things. It says, and you shall afflict your souls, and you shall not do any work therein, but you shall offer a burnt offering unto the Lord for a sweet savor. This is... This is This sweet savor is Christ. It says that over in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. That it might be a sweet savor of Christ coming out of us. This sweet savor is not us doing a work. Just because you don't, just because there's no work done that you do, doesn't mean that he doesn't. He accomplishes it without effort. He is not doing something. He's living. He's coming forth in these sacrifices. He's self-giving. He's glorifying the Father as a sweet savor, not as a sin offering, but as a sweet savor to the Father, that the Father is smelling just that self selflessness that is Christ. You should do no serve by work, but you shall offer so-and-so, so-and-so. All right, I need to quit doing this because I'm about to run out of time. Um, verse 9, let's see, and I think we're only going to, let me look here. Yeah, we're only going to 11. And their meal offering shall be of flour mixed with oil, three-tenths part to a bullock, and two-tenths part to a ram, a tenth part for one lamb throughout the seven lambs. One kid of the goats for a sin offering beside the sin offering of atonement and the continual burnt offering and the meal offering uh, and the meal offering of it, and their drink offerings. All right. What, this is my closing, what is happening 
aside from what the priest is doing. First of all, what is the priest doing on the Day of Atonement? He's taking a bullock and he's offering it for himself. Then he's taking two goats, he's casting lots, and he's picking one, calling it the Lord's goat, and that one he's killing as a sin offering for the people. He's also killing one ram for the bullock as a burn offering and one ram for the goat as a burn offering. But this is telling us that you, but you shall offer a burn offering for sweet savor, one young bullock, one ram, seven lambs. Then you shall, in verse 9, a, a meal offering. And then verse 10, the tenth part of the one, th okay, verse 11, one kid of the goats for a sin offering beside the sin offering of atonement. The high priest is killing a kid, a goat, for a sin offering, but he's telling every one of you to offer one also for a sin offering beside, aside from, beside the sin offering of atonement and to give a burn offering beside the continual burn offering and the meal offerings of it and their drink offerings. All right. So, you may be saying right now, I don't know that I'm getting a lot from this. I am trying to meticulously lay down some things, and I believe that there, you know, that in some ways it may be too much for your head, but it's not too much for your spirit. That the Word of God, the Scriptures are like seeds going into your spirit. And the Holy Spirit will water those and bring forth life from it. Uh, I always have to say this early on in classes, that you have to lay a foundation. You have to put hooks on the wall before you can hang your coat on it. If you don't put those up, you're just going to walk to the wall, put your coat there, and it'll go, pfft. and you're going to wonder why your faith doesn't stick to something. So what I'm trying to do is lay enough scripture and enough reality that when we start getting into it, lights will start going off. Your face will start lighting up like Moses did. Okay. So I'm taking the time to do that. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your precious son and thank you for the Holy Spirit who alone can open our eyes for we are unable to to open our own eyes. And so we hunger for you. And if we're, not, if we're not doing bad right now, if we're doing good, Lord, we just hunger for more of you. We don't have to be doing bad. We don't have to have a crisis to make us want you more. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father, and we love your work in our lives. Holy Spirit, thank you for lifting up Jesus. And so, Father, our hearts in this place have one desire. Make the words and the Word of God life in us. Let us not just hear things and lose it later on. May the fowls of the air not come steal it, but may we hear the truth, and may the truth live in us and become part of our being. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dismissed.